see all these people from across the country. Yay. So welcome everyone. I'm uh, Elaine Ikeda. I'm with LEAD California and uh, we're happy and thrilled to see so many of you joining us. I'm gonna let people continue to enter the space. Um, and, uh, but I am gonna go ahead and get started um, with logistics and all that because we wanna let everyone have as much as Mahdi Soul's time as possible. So as I said, welcome, I'm Elaine Keda, and I'm the executive director of LEAD California and I'm a member of the planning team for Dissertation DISH. I'm excited to be here with you all and uh, with my wonderful colleagues, including my dear friend and our presenter today, Dr. Marisol Morales. Um, I'm gonna provide you a little background. Um, for some of you that you may not have attended our um, first and second uh, webinar, uh, dissertation dish presentations in April and June. We hold them every other month. Um, and dissertation dish is a collaboration between the International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement, IR Slice, Imagining America, and Lead California. And some of you know we were formerly California Campus Compact. These webinars are meant for all. Uh, audiences from seasoned scholars to practitioners to graduate students, as well as hopefully journal journal editors or conference organizers who are seeking scholars to present the most current and innovative research. Uh, our webinars serve to lift up and highlight some of the most recent research that has been done in the community engagement field, creating a way for um, all, all of us to be exposed to new research and good presenters and to offer some support and possible guidance for those who are in graduate programs by way of tips from those who have just gone through the process. So in April and June, we held our first two dissertation dish webinars featuring Dr. Melissa Kwan and Dr. Star Plaxton Moore. You can view their presentations on our LEAD California website. And uh, we've had each time over 120 for our signed up for our first two webinars. And, and today we learned we had 140 sign up for today's webinar. We are recording the webinar. And for those of you who have signed up, you will receive a link to that uh, uh, in the next couple of days, as well as an evaluation and all that. Um, we're gonna do a poll, a very quick poll to find out who's um, in our room today. Uh, we wanna find out if you're a graduate student, um, if you support or mentor graduate students in your current role, and, um, and do you work at a Hispanic serving institution? Yes, no, or not sure. And then um, I thought, uh, I guess uh, we, we aren't asking what role um, you play, but um, so go ahead and take a moment, can complete that, and then we'll review the results in a little bit. But I'm gonna just fill you in a little bit on our agenda for the next 90 minutes or so, which includes um, Dr. Marisol Morales presenting for 20, 25 minutes, a moderated Q&A session with uh, Chris Nive and Nadine Cruz, and I'll say just a little bit more about them in a second. And that'll be for the next 30 minutes or so. And then following that, we're gonna, we are going to have an in-depth, informal conversation with Dr. Marisol Morales and um, anyone who stays on for the final 30 minutes of the webinar. So that'll be where you can unmute yourself um, and participate in a deeper dive into the conversation. And then um, let's see. So the poll results are in. Can everyone see them or? Okay, good. So we have 30% um, graduate students on the call, almost a, a mix of those who say they support grad students uh, in your current role. And then I'm seeing 35% saying yes, sir, to HSI. Great. Um, okay, just a couple more details. Uh, we encourage you to rename yourself by clicking on the three little dots in the upper right-hand corner of your own video image, and then click rename and add your name, um, or if you can fit it in there, your organization or institution and your preferred pronouns, uh, 
obviously that all may not fit. And we also recommend that you select speaker mode um, since there's a lot of folks and this will allow you to keep the speakers up front and center and keep yourself muted during the presentation. If you have questions during the webinar, please post those in the chat. We'll be keeping track of your questions and um, for the Q&A session a little later. And then during the moderated Q&A session, we will review those questions submitted via the chat and the moderators will be able to uh, ask those questions of Dr. Morales. And, um, and then that is it for me and my announcement. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to our co-moderators. I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Chris Naibay, the Associate Vice President of Community Engagement at, um, at the Karen and Tom Mulvaney Center for Community Awareness and Social Action at University of San Diego, and to Nadine Cruz, uh, pioneer and service learning community engagement sage and consultant. And they're gonna kick us off and introduce our featured speaker. Thank you, Elaine. Hey, everyone, it's so good to see you all. Uh, Chris Nive with the Mulvaney Center here at USD and also proudly representing the uh, Iris Slice Board. And just grateful that all of you have joined us today and uh, really appreciative to be part of uh, such an intentional group of colleagues who have helped plan our discussion for today. And just really lucky to co-facilitate um, with Nadine and Elaine and Trina and Aaron who are all such important wisdom holders in our field. Uh, truth be told, I could just sit here all day and listen to them. Um, of course, we're just energized to learn from the brilliance of uh, Dr. Morales, uh, a colleague and dear friend and, and someone who uh, we've been lucky to collaborate with and really learn from over the years and, uh, and also caused some trouble with in Southern California when she was at Laverne representing the West Coast. Um, and it's been just such a gift to witness Dr. Morales's trailblazing ways, um, and really a wonderful pleasure to welcome her as our dissertation dish presenter. Um, so excited to be here. And before I introduce Marisol, I want to invite uh, Nadine to share some opening reflections. Hello there. My name is Nadine Cruz, and I am a recovering education practitioner and leader in higher education. I'm often identified as a pioneer, but we know that it is a problematic term in the context of settler colonialism and our efforts to decolonize education. I prefer simply to be identified as an early disruptor of the colonial meta-narrative of white saviorism in practices that were even more so in the margins than today. Those where anything outside the classroom in different forms of experiential learning um, that today are included in identifiable fields of practice, research, and scholarship. I'm very grateful that the advocacy and practices represented by early experimenters like myself are now becoming codified in research as represented by the past two DISH presenters, Star Paxton Moore and Melissa Kwan, and in today's presenter, Dr. Marisol Morales. As I noted, Dr. Morales' referencing of a now well-established body of scholarship in her lit review and her focus on drawing attention to what continues to be absent in that scholarship, I'm grateful she will share her research and offer new frameworks centered on what is increasingly demographically dominant, the so-called minority students who engage in communities familiar to them and with whom they identify instead of continuing what was more common in the earlier years, my years of civic engagement, which was to locate them as part of the other. So thanks so much, Dr. Morales. We're focusing on you. Thank you, Nadine. Thank I love you. that early disruptor. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we're still on the, uh, so fortunate to be on the ripple effects and on this journey with you and to continue disrupting. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Morales and I'm gonna just read from her 
um, from our notes here. Dr. Morales is the executive director of the Carnegie Elective Classifications, uh, providing conceptual leadership and operational oversight to the elective classifications work. Prior to this role, she was the vice president for network leadership at Campus Compact uh, from 2018 to 2022. Uh, Marisol was the founding director of the Office of Civic and Community Engagement at the University of Laverne uh, and the associate director of the Steen Center for Community-Based Service Learning and Community Service Studies at DePaul University. In 2020, she was appointed as a visiting assistant professor of community-engaged scholarship at the University of Central Florida and also serves as an adjunct faculty in the Enlace Higher Education Master's Program at Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, Marisol sits on the editorial board of the Michigan Journal of Community Service Learning, on the editorial advisory board of Liberal Education, a publication of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and on the board of the International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement. Dr. Morales holds a BA in Latin American Latino Studies and an MS in International Public Service Management, both from DePaul and she earned her EDD in organizational leadership at the University of Laverne uh, in 2020. So please welcome Dr. Morales. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nadine. Hello, friends uh, and future friends. Um, I'm so excited to, to be here. Um, I actually think before I start sharing uh, my slides and working through uh, my presentation, I'm gonna share a little bit from what was in my dissertation given what Nadine shared a little bit earlier. And this is from um, the last chapter. And I think we're gonna make um, the PDF of my dissertation available to folks who read, uh, registered today. Um, my hope is that my work offers perspectives, advice and paths forward that community engagement professionals can consider to collectively move the field forward. I speak from my, from my research, from my experience, my practice and my deepest hopes for what liberation liberation, democracy, and full participation can look like on and off campus. The more time I spent in higher education, the more I saw how it was constructed to be a tool for white supremacy and patriarchy. It is in the maintenance as a tool of exclusion, but I also saw the, need, the seeds of resistance and transformation by people who also understood the liberatory power of education. It is in, this, in that space that I choose to reside, choose to resist, and choose to bring about change. And I hope that the presentation and the research um, that I share with you today is part of that um, legacy. Um, so I am going to attempt to share my screen and see how that works. All right, can folks see that? Great. Um, so the title of um, my work um, is Engaging Sameness, a Phenomenological Study of the Community Engagement Experiences of Latinx Students at a Hispanic Serving Institution. So the slides I'm sharing with you are actually my defense um, slides. So um, we'll kind of take it from there. Um, what I laid out as the purpose of uh, my research um, was to understand the community engagement experiences of six Latinx students or recent graduates from a Hispanic Serving Institution. Um, I chose a qualitative phenomenological um, approach to this research, uh, primarily because I wanted to focus on the phenomenon of the community engagement experiences of Latinx students. So I did semi-structured semi in-depth interviews with these students as a way to capture their understanding of um, their, their experience with community engagement. So a little bit for my problem a statement, um, you know, and I'll ad lib this a little bit, you all can, can read this and we'll have access to it. Um, but much of the way that the sort of literature and structure of service learning and community engagement in higher ed has been framed has been around what uh, Mitchell, Donahue, and Young Law refer to as a pedagogy of whiteness, uh, meaning that it's being taught by white faculty to white students at predominantly white institutions, and students are being sent out to uh, mostly black and brown and poor communities. Um, and so that has kind of historically been the framing. We've been moving in different directions, especially with the demographic changes. Um, but this leaves the question, what happens when we see those demographic changes and we haven't changed our model, right? Um, and so that is what I was um, sort of attempting to look at. Um, 
addressing the gap uh, by focusing on the, and highlighting the community engagement experiences of Latinx students, um, primarily because, uh, and which I sort of state in my own, uh, in my biases, that was me, right? Um, what, happens, um, what happens when um, we are not seen in our uh, classes and in our community engagement experiences and what's the difference of when we are seen. So in terms of my literature review, I looked at uh, Hispanic serving institutions, minority serving institutions and <laughs> I think somebody needs to be put themselves on mute. Um, and um, as my bigger category, and as I narrowed down, um, I looked at service learning, community engagement and race the long-term impact of, of service learning and then Latinx students uh, and community engagement and then critical theories and, and pedagogies, particularly related to uh, critical race theory. So some of the theoretical frameworks that I utilized uh, was community cultural wealth, uh, looking at Yoso's work, uh, applied critical leadership, looking at Santa Maria and Santa Maria's work, critical service learning from our dear friend and colleague, Zinia Mitchell, and asset-based community development from Kretzman and McKnight. And how these um, both informed um, kind of my particular understanding of community engagement in the way that I came to this work, but also how those could be used to understand um, what um, these students were, were sharing with, with me. And all, uh, you know, sort of, I, I'd say three of the four had direct connections to critical race theory, um, where asset based community development um, in its evolution could uh, see some connection to, to that. So, in terms of my methodology, like I said, I used a phenomenological research methodology. Um, and a lot of this was on uh, sort of discussion through with my chair. Uh, and different approaches. Um, I can tell you at first I had a huge, like I wanted to do different types of minority serving institutions, HBCUs, tribal colleges, HSIs. Um, I wanted to do grounded uh, theory. I wanted to do all of this stuff and um, reality set in and uh, the narrow focus um, conversation was had. And so um, for those graduate students, narrow, narrow, narrow right away. Um, I did, because it was a qualitative study uh, and a phenomenological study, um, I had a small number of, of research participants. So I looked at um, six students, some were current students, some were recent graduates at a um, large metropolitan um, Hispanic serving institution uh, in an urban area. Um, the HSI selected was uh, one of the oldest four-year publics in the Midwest. Um, to have a designation of HSI. So this was a place that um, had both thoroughly understood uh, and been connected to its identity as a Hispanic serving institution, which is really important because of the sort of evolutionary nature of, of HSIs um, and the fact that many are still predominantly white institutions. And um, unlike HBCUs and tribal colleges were not created to serve, you know, Latinx students um, in, in its, as part of its own history. Uh, it, they just kind of became. Um, I had an eligibility survey um, to make sure that um, students met the requirement, had taken a service learning or community engagement course, were over 18, um, you know, uh, were of Latinx background. Um, and then I used semi-structured questions for um, the interview process. Um, as part of the phenomenological research, there were sort of six phases um, of uh, data review and analysis. So reading, reflective writing and interpretation. So, you know, going back and doing several reads, um, taking notes, identifying themes. Uh, and I used in vivo for my coding and um, theme development, which is really helpful in terms of kind of seeing and placing um, the stories that students were sharing. I also want to note um, that I was, um, you know, really blessed to uh, be a story holder for, for these students, to share that space uh, and have them um, feel comfortable enough to 
um, engage and share those stories as part of this research as a way to really capture, I think, um, many of the experiences um, that they had, both positive and negative at their institution um, that contributed to their community engagement experiences. So again, I looked at six Latinx um, students, four current students and two recent graduates from the specific HSI at four females uh, and two males. Um, in terms of ethnic, Latino ethnic background, I had four that identified as Mexican, one is Colombian, and one is Guatemalan, and all but one were born in the United States. Um, the age range was between 18 and 28, and they were from you know, traditional freshmen to um, recent graduates uh, and a range of both traditional and non-traditional students. Um, all worked, two of them worked on campus, but they were all work, working. Um, and four were first-generation um, students and all were commuters. So these were my specific research questions. I wanted to know how academically based community engagement impacted Latinx students' uh, college going experiences. Are there ways in which their community cultural capital, uh, the community cultural capital of Latinx students is being activated or accessed through academically based community engagement experiences at a Hispanic serving institution? And are Latinx students connecting their academically based community engagement experiences to the long history of community engagement in ethnic studies programs? with Latinx faculty um, and staff, Latinx student activism, or with the Latinx um, local community. Um, and this question I just wanna highlight um, because I think often in the literature, particularly in the field of service learning and community engagement, um, we miss out on the fact that ethnic studies was, uh, came out of actually community engagement and deeply connected to, to this work, but is not oftentimes seen as um, connected to our broader field of, of uh, service learning and community engagement. Um, and hoping to um, understand that more. Um, I wasn't, it didn't come out in this particular research, um, but I'd love to be in collaboration with other folks uh, at some point to look at this question more deeply in our field and in our literature. So what were some of the findings? These were, um, these were some of the quotes that I just pulled out to, to share, but I wanna talk a little bit about um, the, the students. Um, so this particular student, uh, Dana Rocho, um, you know, was, um, you know, had a particularly interesting story. Um, she was 28, a recent graduate um, of the institution, and she um, had actually transferred from a different institution to finish out um, at this HSI. And um, her family experienced uh, gun violence. Her brother was killed because of gang violence. Um, and how that impacted uh, her experience at the university and specifically her community engagement experience. So I'll share this uh, with you, this at least one quote. Um, I feel like the internship, which was a community engagement uh, uh, internship in particular just reminded me, hey, there's preventative actions that should be done and should be taken. And there is information and resources out there that should be shared so that we don't have this overpopulation of inmates in our prison system. Whereas it was more about I, the other community internship that she did. It was more about, um, I live in the community actually like doing this. I like engaging, I like being a resource. I like connecting other people to resources that can help them either continue to grow, um, expand or just make it through that little hump that they're going through. So I feel like on both sides, it just allowed me to discover passions that I had and that I had not had a chance to act on outside of school. So she's talking about these two community engagement experiences that, that she had. Um, later on in the, in the research and in the interview, she shared how, particularly with the, she was, she was engaged in a prison writing project. And this was after her, her brother was, was killed. And how she, you know, she could have operated from a space like, you know, everybody there deserves it. 
but this class and that engagement helped her see that uh, connection to sort of the systematic nature of incarceration and violence in communities in ways that she probably wouldn't have been able to see had she not been in the class kind of during that time. Um, another student, Janessa Ramirez, um, in talking about her community engagement experiences, um, talked about her mother. My mother came here undocumented and received amnesty. Then my brother is an undocumented person also, but he has a DACA status, but then everyone else in my family is, is documented. So it's something that for a lot of the students that are in the resistance group, the resistance group was her community engagement experience. That's what the faculty member called it. We can connect to it. So that's why we wanted to predominantly work with the undocumented families. So talking about motivation. Um, and these all connect to some of the uh, pieces that I'm gonna share with, uh, with you around the model. So this particular student, Adam Burgos, who was a non-traditional student who had started at the institution and then had to step out for five years because he had family issues come up. His father left the home, his grandmother died, his mother became ill and lost her her job, so he had to take up primary responsibility, but still was very motivated. Um, was talking about a faculty member that he had. He says, she's African-American. She lived all her life in the Lincoln Park area um, that is very diverse with both Black and Latino communities. It made me stay the course and not drop it because she told us about her experiences, her struggles as a student. She had troubles at home as well. So she really connected with a lot of the students and then she always created a safe space where she, could, where she would never judge us and even allowed us to share our own personal experiences and our own struggles. The class, it felt more like family. Like you would just, but they just understood you regardless of their ethnicity. We had a wide variety of ethnicities from Asian students to white students to Latinx students and even African-American students and even some transgender students. But it was the wide range of everyone um, wide range of everyone like understood each other. Uh, and there we validated each other's struggles, each other's experiences and what we've gone through. So it felt, it just felt like we were a big, we were a bit of a family. So these are students talking about um, their community engagement experiences um, with different faculty, with different sort of contexts. Um, and also um, sort of, the opportunities that were available to them that the professors made available to them as their community engagement experiences. So what were some of the themes that I pulled out from um, my research? Um, one were, or the, the set of themes were agency, awareness, agency, and action, positive interaction with faculty, engaging sameness, so personal connection with service, and engagement for upliftment. So let me share what each of those are. Um, so awareness agency and action form a triad that describes the salient aspects of classroom-based community engagement experiences of the six Latinx students interviewed for this research. Awareness refers to the introduction of new knowledge or concepts that students were presented that helped them make sense of the world. Agency became an extension of awareness when one realizes they possess the power or ability to change. Agency is imbued with critical analysis of the root cause of social issues. Agency is at the center of practice, the application of theory and practice, or classroom knowledge and community-based experiences. Action refers to the ways the Latinx students and recent graduates in the research are taking the lessons they learned and the engagement they had in community-based learning um, experiences and extending that into what they do beyond their graduate, undergraduate education. It's a connection that links awareness of structural or social issues to the realization that they have agency and power to create change and action to live into that change. So it was definitely a process for these students, but all connected to this sort of uh, blossoming into um, awareness of the issue, understanding their own role and agency in it, and pathways to, to act on it. Positive interaction with faculty referred to the ways in which participants described the experience they had with faculty who taught the community-based learning courses. Um, this described um, as participants feeling that faculty cared for them, shared similar stories, and made time for them and treated them as people. So there were experiences shared that 
you know, a faculty member who was white um, made the effort to pronounce my name correctly. Or a faculty member who was African-American, like you saw in the previous quote, shared her own stories, created safe spaces for students to share theirs, had this connection to, to the students. And that was all reinforced through these positive experiences of feeling cared for by um, these students. Um, and just to note, um, the majority of the students went to public high schools um, and several of them referred to those experiences um, and not feeling cared for and not feeling respected. Um, and so having that different experience at, at their um, institution uh, made quite a bit difference. And then engaging sameness is the concept that Latinx students and recent graduates in the research had a personal connection to the population they were serving as part of their community engagement course. The participants did service for the most part with the Latinx community on issues uh, from immigration to cultural programming, homelessness, food insecurity, uh, immigrant or Spanish speaking youth in school settings. And so it may not have been the neighborhood that they came from, but it was still a Latino community and it's still, they were still working on issues that they either had personally experienced or their family had experienced. So there was a deep personal connection to um, the service. And then finally, engagement for upliftment. And this signifies the ways in which the participants interpreted or defined community engagement uh, to be in service of bettering, empowering, or lifting up the community. It included aspects of reciprocity, as well as how they see themselves as agents of change or how their future careers will be focused on uplifting and helping their community. Um, finally, there was a set of significant factors that impacted their, um, their community engagement experience. So there was issues around personal familial trauma, whether it was divorce, whether it was the fear of, um, a fear of their family being deported, um, whether it was um, domestic violence in, in their home, uh, loss of job, but there was some sort of sort of tra trauma or impact, um, like I shared with Dana, her brother being killed. There were constraints on the students. Some of them were financial constraints. They were solely responsible for paying their tuition. They had to um, work one or two jobs. Um, they were helping to not only uh, support themselves, but their families. Um, or issues around time, right? There, um, some had strict parents who um, you know, didn't understand their, um, their need to go to community organizations and, and sort of do this service, right? And then all of them had previous experience with service, either through church or through their public high school who had a service learning um, requirement. So they didn't come into this not knowing, um, and they had experience with service. So I spent a little bit more time on this, um, but I wanted you to understand some of the background as I move into the models. So what I came up with based on um, looking at the themes and significant factors was, was this prism of liberatory engagement. And so really the prism is meant to um, be just what a prism does, right? When you look through a prism, it allows you to see things differently, right? This white light that's coming in and you look through the prism and you see the different colors that exist. And much like the ways in which we need tools to see the different experiences that our students bring in. In this case, um, what the significant factors um, of personal familial uh, trauma, constraints, and uh, previous service experience help us to more deeply understand the Latinx students and the ways in which they're sort of going through this process of um, awareness, agency, and action, engagement for equipment, engaging sameness and, and positive uh, uh, faculty interaction and how that impacts their community engagement experiences. Um, some of the limitations um, are there is a small sample size, uh, not generalizable uh, given that. Um, I had limited a number of majors, uh, mainly social science, uh, lack of Latinx uh, participant diversity, um, you know, I would love uh, I would love to get some Puerto Rican students, but uh, alas, I did not. And then my own uh, bias as a as a researcher. Um, the other piece uh, or conclusions and recommendations for re for the research was another model that I came up with, uh, which is um, titled asset based critical engagement. So while this one is the ways in which we 
um, utilized to sort of think about the ways in which we support Latinx students and what their community engagement experiences look like. This model, uh, and I have a, a bigger slide with it and I'm happy to talk about it more, really looks at practitioners, faculty and staff who are creating these experiences and the things that we need to take into consideration as we are. So um, asset-based uh, critical engagement um, asks us to, um, it's an inclusive, it uh, is inclusive of non-traditional social capital that Latinx students bring to their community engagement experiences and their institutions along with the external factors that impact um, their engagement. So we think about it from the course content being social justice oriented, um, looking at uh, critical service learning as a lens. We look at it um, as embracing faculty's own diversity and experiences and social justice orientations um, through applied critical leadership. We look at um, the ways in which we choose and work with community partners. I'm sorry, I got doggies. Um, through asset-based community development and the ways in which we engage and look at our students uh, and create experiences through a community cultural wealth lens. And so those together um, sort of create this asset-based critical engagement that allows us to, I think, think more deeply about the ways in which we're creating um, the experiences for, for students um, and the ways in which we're uh, assessing our own practice, assessing our partnerships, um, and um, you know the content that we have in, in, in the course. Um, I will leave it there. Um, and I have, there's some implications in uh, the last chapter of, of the dissertation, uh, provide some, some recommendations. Um, and then I have sort of these last two slides to go back and have further discussions. Uh, but I think I'm at time and I will, um, Leave it there. Are we doing questions now? Thank you, Marisol. And um, I think Nadine is gonna share just some, maybe a couple, a reaction or two, and then maybe kick us off with our first question. Well, I was thinking as you were talking, Marisol, that there really wasn't enough time to really focus on what I consider one of the most important contributions in your dissertation, which uh, requires a background which you gave, but I think it is a deep form of what I call theorizing in the context of what we call praxis. That is the dialogue between having deep experiences in the actual practice of doing this, while also beginning to reframe by offering different theories with which to see phenomena that we deal with using a prior lens that we are attempting to de deconstruct. And so I'm thinking that what you've done is you're not only disrupting a dominant narrative, which is limited to sort of a, um, a, a white curriculum, but it's also that you are offering a different framework, which is part of theorizing. And that is really super tough work. And I'm thinking that it would be great if we could be part of a circle of people who build on your work and others to re-theorize so that we can have new frameworks and new theories that have traction. I love that idea and I welcome collaboration. Thank you, Nadine. And, and if that invitation uh, comes with uh, an invite to some good food in your kitchen to see how that kind of continues to catalyze further collaboration. Yeah, food and theorizing go very yeah. well together. Love it. <laughs> As you know, Chris, in our Filipino culture, food is at the center of everything. And so if you're going to do any serious work, 
you have to eat first. Absolutely. But I love the question that um, is out there, what surprised you most in your research? Um, I think I was most surprised by um, the way the students talked about the positive interaction with, with faculty and what difference that made for them, um, especially around the idea of being respected and felt, feeling like um, faculty were willing to be, at least for these students in these classes and with this community engagement experience, be vulnerable with the students um, to create a safe uh, space that allowed students to be vulnerable with them. Um, and I think that that helps students take in um, the experience and the learning and, and synthesize it through that process uh, of awareness uh, analysis and, and action. But that's a whole training that we don't get in graduate school. So unfortunately, what it is that you're asking faculty to be able to do is a whole nother piece of work, a lifetime work to, ac to accompany all the intellectual and research labor that goes into being an educator. But this is where I think applied critical leadership, the work of Santa Maria actually comes in because there is right that framework, that leadership model. Um, that's focused on uh, educational leaders and the ways in which identity and owning that and it being a part of your leadership style, um, you know, it can happen. Um, and so the, the model that I shared in terms of um, asset-based critical engagement includes that um, as an important aspect of creating this sort of balanced approach to what engagement looks like, what the difference is, right? Um, it is that in our own individual practice, what does it mean to bring our whole selves to, to these spaces, to allow um, that, that participation um, with who we are um, for our students to, to be part of. And I think, again, the applied critical leadership uh, for me was a, a really important model in thinking about that and also for giving me language in the way that I have hit um, historically um, thought about my own leadership, right? The, the ways in which, uh, for good or bad, and some of you have been at institutions and organizations where you you, you saw this, uh, the good and the bad of it um, happen to me or others, um, it is just a part of who we are. And what does it mean to walk in that space, but also have some understanding that there's actually um, some research and some justification for, for why we do uh, and show up in those ways. Money. So we have some good questions coming up. So I'll try to um, get to some of them. And uh, these are really rich uh, textualized questions. So if we just as a reminder, um, we'll close up kind of the formal part in about 15 minutes. And then um, if we don't get to some of these, and if you all have the time, we're going to spend another 30 uh, minutes in like a deep dive uh, virtual happy hour. Let's let's say it that way. Um, and before we get into this, you know, I'm Marisol, I'm curious, I wanted to start with just a broad question to learn more about you, you know, the, the theme of justice and equity are just so intertwined in your core values, and they so align with your work, it's, it's, um, you'd like to really embody that, can you just share how and when that took shape in your life? Shit. Um... Happy hour question. Okay, let's take one. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, I will say that I uh, I went to Catholic schools all my life and Second Vatican to Catholic schools. So I think more social justice oriented, but it wasn't really until uh, I took a class in college at another Catholic school uh, called US Colonialism of Puerto Rico that gave me the space to engage in some of that same process I talked about the students doing the awareness agency and, and action piece. Um, and I think in that sense, it took sort of the seeds of the schooling and upbringing that I had. Um, and you know, my father's a very ethical person. Like he will not park in a handicapped space, even if it's just to run in for five minutes and get some, like it, there's sort of some black and white things uh, in that sense. But, um, I think it was really that class that became the synthesis for my own engagement, my own um, identity development, and my um, deep commitment to, to this um, work. 
um, as a practice of, of liberation. Um, so I see a question about the concept of service uh, and some conversations in the field about uh, the inherent power asymmetries uh, dominant group. So um, I will say it this way. Um, often the term power, power is, is not a bad word. It is about the way that it is used uh, and the way that it is engaged in. And, um, and I, I feel the same way about service. I don't have a problem saying I served in this capacity. I, I am in service, right? Um, I think that um, it is about the way it is used. And if we are uh, coming from a white supremacy perspective, then we're gonna use it in a bad way because that's bad, right? But if we're coming in um, through a space of uh, liberation connection and, and collectivity, then I think that we all should be in service to, to one another. We should all be in service to, to the, the community because it because for me, essentially the term service is um, about decentering self and centering um, community. Um, so I, I understand where those um, sort of when it's situated within power dynamics, the problematics of it, but that I, I feel is also what we have to resist against, um, be conscious of, right, name, um, but also um, resist uh, against because many folks who are in the community will tell you that they are also in service of. Um, uh, okay, about the phenomenological approach, how you think it might be useful for future research in the field. What I appreciated about the phenomenological approach, with I, which I didn't know until I um, sort of sat down with my dissertation chair, um, was thinking about the way that you're looking at a specific phenomenon. So you're not like you're pushing away in this particular phenomenon. And it allows you to sort of reach this depth um, and it's the, um, the subject that is providing some of that meaning making in the, in the process, which I really uh, appreciated, right? So I could ask questions um, to help them think, but in that they were actually doing the meaning making themselves as they were talking about the ways in which the experiences um, supported their understanding or connected to, to different things. Um, and then the ability to sort of go through that process, that cycle of reading, sitting with it, taking notes, coming back, and, and, and um, making more meaning out of the meaning that, that the subjects made. So for me, it was, it, as I got into the data, I actually felt really excited to sort of, um, you know, it's like going to, this may be a bad analogy, but going through to a thrift store and like digging around and finding these gems and like digging some more and so the, like the power of what this meant for somebody and now what it can mean for for you is is um what i appreciated about about their approach um and i like the the story sharing um i think it, that comes out of sort of long cultural traditions um and so for me the phenomenological approach um attached to that uh feedback um so uh, just in terms of the committee work, um, I actually was lucky in the sense that um, only my chair had to be from the institution. I was able to invite committee members from, who were experts in the field. So John Saltmarsh sat on my committee as well as Mari Castaneda from UMass uh, Amherst. And so uh, for me, being able to have those outside experts was really powerful. Um, in terms of getting the feedback that I sort of wanted to, to um, explore um, with, with my research. Uh, so do I think the institution's HSI affiliation had an impact on their service learning? I do, um, in, particularly in the way that the students talked about um, the faculty, like it came out most in those questions in terms of the faculty knowing who the students are, the faculty being, you know, used to working with, with um, Latinx communities or so, and because that is such, be, again, I chose an HSI that was like the, um, one of the oldest HSIs um, in the Midwest had owned this kind of title for a long time, had received different awards, had different programming available. So it was part of sort of the culture. 
Um, not to say that it was widely um, embraced by everyone, but at least the faculty who the students identified in these courses had an understanding of that student population and had actually worked with that student population for you know 20 plus years. So I think it did have uh, an impact um, and particularly with that understanding. Uh, uh, reading, uh, let's see. And people can also, I guess, unmute too. Um, would it have been different at a different institution type? Um, I think so. And I think it would depend on the, um, the class and who the faculty was. Um, so, the, so I'm referring to um, the question, um, would it have been the same uh, at a different uh, institutional type, non-minority serving institution, R1, small public? Um, and I think more because of the experiences that I had um, at different institutions and at Campus Compact, seeing where the struggles for many institutions and faculty were around, around this. Um, and so it makes a difference when the institution recognizes that their student population has changed, right? That they're not teaching the same students that they taught in the 80s or the 90s or the you know, early 2000s. And so that difference, um, makes a difference in how faculty are showing up for, for students. I also think that um, the, the ways in which um, the students talked about their engagement projects, right? So one student, or the faculty referred their, to their uh, engagement projects as resistance groups, right? So those that's situated right in the language of, of sort of liberation and, and social justice. Um, they talked about the prisoners prison uh, writing project, right? Um, and so, you know, the types of experiences that were created in the organizations that were chosen were um, along these, these same lines. Not that those can't exist um, in different kinds of institutions, um, but I think it's going to be very particular. And, and um, you know, and, you, and, and those are the kind of faculty that, um, you know, you would, you would know, right, that students would I identify. Um, and... Do I still have a few so, minutes? Yeah, so related to that, what suggestions would you give emerging HSIs who are trying to build a more inclusive infrastructure on their path to becoming an HSI? So I'm gonna share my screen again. So I really think that um, looking at this piece, right? So this is what I talk about in terms of the, the prism. You know, often we use a prism to sort of look at the differences and understand it. And so utilizing that same idea, the ability to sort of think about the nuances of our engagement that we can't just pick five sites for a, a project and hope that all the students can, can fit into that. That there has to be some agency given or some parameters or ability for students to choose the sites. Um, that if you're thinking about your student population, what is the variety of, of um, you know, community partners that, that you have? What kinds of materials are being included in the classroom, in the readings? What ways are the students' community cultural wealth being um, acknowledged, right? Um, where they can utilize it, say, in working with, uh, we had, I had students who were working with Spanish speaking um, preschoolers, right? And so they were able to, to utilize that language skill um, in spaces where maybe even the, the paid teacher did not have that and they, they were able to listen to, to students. So I think it, it, some of it's about the diversity of, of the experiences. Um, I also think it's about understanding, you know, really these significant factors, the personal familial trauma, the previous experience with service, the constraints, like these can change, right? But having a layer where there's enough flexibility to move the prism um, and like a kaleidoscope, right? To be able then to um, create um, interventions and support for students that really help meet, meet their needs. The, the days of um, kind of just one way 
or, or teaching to the middle, I don't think can, can, can exist anymore. We have to create more nuance in our spaces and more opportunities for, for our students. And also create, I think, safe spaces for our faculty um, and staff who are doing the critical work with the students, that unpaid labor of support, mentoring, and counseling to show up as their full authentic selves without um, being um, being in toxic environments that, that, that don't honor those. So, you know, I think emerging HSIs can think about cluster hires and thinking about bringing in a significant amount of Latinx and diverse faculty who have these experiences who can support these students. I think for institutions, you know, part, part of these students were talking about their faculty and most of their faculty were actually uh, African-American faculty. So thinking about the ways that even our diverse faculty can uh, support, um, you know, um, different types of, of students, right, that share some sort of solidarity and, and connection. And that's primarily because that, that faculty member was able to show up as herself, right, was able to um, provide examples of her own life to share with students that students can connect to because she also understand, understood who her student population was. And it gave them, I think, a sense of like, wow, if she's gone through all of this, then I can also, you know, do it. Like there is a pathway for this. And that mentorship and those examples, I think oftentimes our institutions take for granted, but those are key to actually having our Latinx and diverse students, um, you know, not only uh, persist, but actually graduate from, from our institutions. Um, those are the stories that also, um, I think, um, need to be shared. As Adam shared in his thing, in his quote, like it was really this faculty and her sharing that made him not drop the course or made, made him um, sort of work, work around the constraints of uh, time or work or whatever to, to make this course for, um, work for him. So thank you, Marisol. Um, you know, really just some, well, and first, hopefully you're seeing uh, some of the love you're receiving on the chat and just really important and powerful wisdom um, you know, the spirit of your work is just really aligned with how you continue to help build deep community and, and you just are all about opening the door for so many, including me, um, and many others, um, uh, in our discussion today. So just appreciate you, Marisol, for sharing your work, um, which has also been really critical and life affirming work for so many. Um, and, you know, especially important given the last few years. So, uh, you know, your leadership and commitment lifts all of us up. And I know your dear mom is proud and dancing in your honor. Um, so appreciate you. Uh, just as a reminder, so we're gonna close our, our kind of formal session here and we're gonna go into a salon type 30 minute discussion um, here in about a minute. But before we do that, just thank you to um, uh, all of you for attending and for being with us today and for all of the work that you all are doing in the field uh, collectively. Uh, thank you to Imagining America, to Iris Slice, and to Lead California for this collaboration and uh, for everyone in front and behind the scenes to make today happen. So with that, I just wanted to pause. Trina, did I cover everything? Is there anything you wanted to add? So we also are going to be sending out a recording of this webinar with the evaluation. And I wanted to plug that the next dissertation dish will be held on Tuesday, October 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific time and will feature Dr. Sean Crossland from University Valley, Utah, Univer Utah Valley University. And it's going to focus on his research with community colleges and civic engagement. Um, in particular, uh, a very active college in the Bay Area here in California. So um, again, thank you everyone. And um, for those who wish to stay on, we will um, we'll get started in that in just a little bit um, and have a, a more robust open discussion where you can unmute yourself. But thank you everyone else for well, participating. Thanks everybody for coming. This is hard like to, try to truncate everything in a short amount of time and actually get to the meat of it. So um, 